Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the pleasure and the honor of being just after lunch. It's hard, but it may get inside you if you, you want to rest, but still be attentive. Anyway, I'm from Latin America. I'm based in Bogota. I'm myself from Cordoba, Argentina. And I am from Geocensus. Geocensus is a foundation that has been using OpenStreetMap since 2010. We've been participating in some of the state of the map events and so on. So we are here to advocate somehow, because we really are convinced that having so many large cities in Latin America, we can do something about the smart city participation. What, what we think basically is that we need to still go a long way about participation in cities and collaboration also, because although there are many initiatives that are helping the OpenStreetMap movement going forward, they are also scattered around, and we have several tools to do so, but we still don't have the very specific, not to say representation, but a place where the smart cities are developed. So I want to advocate and just point a few ideas about it, and maybe you could also feedback me on later, I don't know, on, on, on the breaks. So our idea is that basically there are so many tools, one of them being this portal from TriMet. TriMet is this huge system in Portland that includes buses and light red trains and computer trains and also that, that has so many users and it's being used to plan a really smart city. This is then done all together with the OSM platform. Also, the OCities, it's a server that takes that data from, from OpenStreetMap, but it's also for indoor mapping. And this is very important for recreational purposes. Most of the malls and also campuses and, you know, smaller, scale, uh, bigger scale, scale of the spatial object can be done, can be mapped uh, indoor mapping. And this is very important for smart cities because people may use them a lot. And also, there's a project from StatCan. I don't know if you've been at the HUD Summit. How many of you have been at the HUD Summit recently? This was in Canada, in, in Ottawa. And the StatCan, the National Statistic Office there, they ran a pilot to show that Ottawa could be covered all together with an open stream map platform. And this is to demonstrate governments that they can work together with civil society. So that's our point, that there are so many tools and also projects going on, but still we don't have a specific focus on smart cities. So the idea was to share these advocate challenges we, we think about, mostly about the appropriation of the great space we have for public and civic collaboration within this outlook that is going on, mostly in Latin America, we have really big cities, and this is very important for us. So I think we will be working on in this, in this issue. But also, a good March city plan should include the advocation for the bottom-up approach. Most of these partnerships, they are built together with the private sector and governments, but they don't expressly include the civic society participation, so I think it's great starting point that there are so many tools that we can do better in the future in the future so finally making sure that the smart city includes us and, and it's able to understand us uh, this will help a lot with the future developments because if we really know that people are going to use our apps and our developments uh, then it's much more easier to get to government and to stay closer to society as a whole. We are mostly technical people here, but we really need to get into the talk and into the dialogue with government. So that was our point and bringing it here with great opportunity to exchange more with you guys. So thank you very much for your time and for your moments. Thanks. You want to announce yourself? Hello, everyone. All right. Oh, full screen. There we go. Okay, thank you. All right, my name is Viet Nguyen. I am from 
Portland, Oregon, and it's not Halloween, but I'm dressing up as a rock climber because I, I am one. Um, very excited to be here. Where is? Sorry about that. Yeah, as you can see, I'm dressing up to, to go on a rock climb before heading out to the mountains. Besides the obvious gear, ropes, carabiners, guess what's the other thing that people usually bring? Well, these days, my friends and myself, we all carry a smartphone. So last year, I started thinking about maybe I can find some public data set and build maps for myself and my friends, and we can share them among ourselves. Uh, the problem is there aren't any public data available for, for me to use. So I was happy to encounter OpenStreetMap and I did a quick query and surprise, there was a lot of data. Do you want to guess how many objects marked as the sport equals climbing? All right. Um, actually, C is the correct answer. There's over 11,000 objects uh, tagged with sport eco climbing. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of them in Europe, but like, I can see the flat iron out of the window, but it's, like, it's blank in the, on the map. So I started a project, and it's strictly my uh, labor of love, uh, self-funded. It's called the Open Beta Initiative. Basically, it's uh, an app for rock climbers to share climbing data, to edit and contribute. And the data are going to be in OpenStreetMap. Um, yeah, I, uh, what else I need to talk about? So yeah, there's a lot of work needs to be done, and uh, if you have comments, ideas, pull requests on GitHub, uh, would be appreciated. Speaker notes? Uh, I can go off without it, so okay. Hi, uh, my name is Ming Nguyen. Um, the other Ming Nguyen, uh, the other Nguyen here. Uh, and uh, so um, I'm here to talk about San Jose, where I live. Uh, there's a song about San Jose. I uh, wonder if any of you have heard it. Uh, so for those of you who, uh, who only know San Jose from the Dionne uh, Warwick song, uh, it's the 10th largest city in America. Um, which is pretty big, uh, and uh, it's also a pretty sprawling place, but it gets overshadowed by a smaller uh, city to the north uh, called San Francisco. A and, uh, and that's, and OSM is no exception. Uh, uh, so San Jose also kind of sh is in the shadow of San Francisco in terms of OSM participation, both by local um, kind of like craft mappers and also by uh, armchair mappers and, and, other, uh, and others. Uh, and so, there, there, are, there are people in San Jose mapping in OpenStreetMap, I'm one of them, uh, but for a long time we didn't really know who each other were. Uh, we didn't coordinate, we didn't see each other face to face, um, and there weren't uh, any meetups actually uh, for an eight year span from 2009 to 2017. Uh, and uh, the one in, uh, in 2009 was uh, organized by CloudMade, if any of you remember CloudMade. Um, so, uh, the lack of local coordination has meant that OSM's quality, uh, its coverage in, in the South Bay is, uh, is uneven. Um, so, so the most basic things, you think like tiger cleanup, cleaning up the tiger import, that stuff actually happened quite early. Uh, and that's, that's in a pretty good shape. Um, and really as far as roads go, uh, San Jose and South Bay are in pretty good shape because um, companies like my employer Mapbox, for example, are, are invested in making sure that it's uh, suitable for turn-by-turn -turn navigation and routing, things like that. Um, so the roads are in good shape and so is uh, cycling infrastructure. 
because of the tireless efforts of, um, of people, of cycling enthusiasts uh, who live in uh, neighboring areas. Um, but on the flip side, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are definitely things that are quite lacking in the area. So public transportation coverage in the South Bay, in San Jose, uh, is almost non-existent. And that, that's a stark contrast to neighboring counties, uh, like San Francisco County. Um, there's also uh, a, a, you know, so there are buildings being added, but it's kind of at a plotting pace. Um, so it's not the kind of like comprehensive building coverage that you might expect from a large American city at this point. Um, and in terms of uh, points of interest, there, you know, if you go to um, some, of the, some of the touristy areas, you might find good coverage of points of interest, but there's still plenty of uh, POI deserts, um, especially in ethnic neighborhoods and, and so forth. I'm going to expand on that last point about points of interest, actually, um, which is, uh, so uh, I was curious about how, how well we had points of interest, co points of interest covered, so uh, I picked up a phone book. Uh, and I, I took a look at um, the business white pages and the yellow, pa uh, yellow pages uh, for the 408 area code that contains San Jose. Um, and uh, I'll have a, a proper write-up about this uh, posted online shortly, but um, so I just want to present some of the, the takeaways from that. Um, and the biggest one is that uh, OSM, compared to this admittedly imperfect uh, um, other source, uh, has 23% as many named POIs. Um, so when you think about it, I mean, that's not a lot, but when you think about who has been doing that, that's with a community that has been fragmented and not really coordinating. Um, in that 23%, uh, we've mapped 94% as many restaurants and 78% of, pla of the places of worship. Uh, and when you dive down into the different categories that the Yellow Pages has, it, it, you get some interesting findings. Uh, so OSM does really well uh, when it comes to retail, uh, when it comes to entertainment, and motorist services, and uh, apparently we do pretty well in, in terms of cannabis as well. Um, yeah, the phone book doesn't have any. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, we don't do quite as well when it comes to professional services, which you don't also kind of expect to, to see in a data set like OSM's. Uh, so we like cannabis more than taxes, apparently. Um, but uh, so um, looking ahead to the future, um, uh, we benefit, we're benefiting now, uh, more recently, from a partnership with Code for San Jose, the local uh, Code for America uh, brigade. Uh, they helped us, um, they basically sought out all the local mappers, got us all together, recruited more people, and we're, we had our first mapathon since 2009, since, cl since CloudMade, and we're keeping up the mom momentum with uh, monthly meetups. Uh, so at, at these meetups, we're, we're, doing, we're adding POIs from Mapillary, we are importing sidewalks, and if you have been following some mailing list discussions, we have definitely been adding sidewalks, but we're also committed to adding crosswalks to fill in the gaps. So um, we're in this for the long haul, uh, because we're not going back to how things were before, which was people sitting in their armchairs doing, doing mapping, but nothing else. Um, and if you're interested in uh, the South Bay in San Jose, uh, we do have a mailing list, a wiki page, and we're on Slack. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian. I maintain the ID editor. This is the default. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no more, no. I got a lot to get through in five minutes. <laughs> um, this is the default editor you use on OpenStreetMap to edit the map from your browser. So let's get into it. Um, this is just an overview of what we've been up to in the last month. It's a one-month snapshot. You can see like 36 pull requests, 28 of them got merged, 66 active issues, and 49 of them got closed, and 18 people contributing. Um, this is like a really busy project, right? Um, and while we're usually busy, we kind of have something special going on right now. It is Hacktoberfest. So <laughs> this is a promotion that DigitalOcean and GitHub are running to get more people interested in open source. So um, maintainers can tag issues that are good for first-time contributors, and anyone who makes four pull requests in October gets some free swag. So win-win, right? Um, we're participating in this. We've tagged a bunch of issues as Hacktoberfest and Help Wanted and Good First Issue. So if you're looking to like, jump in and get you know, involved in contributing to ID, now is a great time to do it. Um, please help. The emoji is not there, but it goes, looks like this. <laughs> Sunday, I think we're even having a hack day here, so um, maybe we could like get together and close some of these issues. Okay, so where are we today? 
ID is at version 2.4.3. I release maybe once or twice a month, um, but sometimes it'll go a few months if you know, we're working on something big. And uh, we're gonna take a look at what we've accomplished in the past year. So it's funny to think that a year ago we were just getting ready to release ID version two. And this is like a really big change in how the code got built. Um, we were also upgrading to D3 version four at the same time. So to think that like a year ago, we had these few months where like nothing was working and all the tests were failing. And it was like kind of a pretty scary time, but, but we got through it and that kind of paved the way for a bunch of really great work that we've done since then. So we'll take a look. Um, ID2 launched with uh, right to left support. So this is pretty cool. Like if you speak Arabic or Hebrew, you know, it actually flips the entire interface right to left so that those users can um, use ID in a more natural way. Then in February, we added some new operations. These are for reflecting shapes. You can see here I'm mapping some baseball fields, but it's also useful for mapping like certain types of like repetitive looking buildings. Then last spring, we uh, replaced the old, ID had a circular menu that would sort of pop up on top of whatever you were doing. And my, my sh shout out to um, Kushan and Rasagie for building this new edit menu. It works on right click. And while the circular menu was great for kind of discovering what the commands were that you could do, it was kind of getting annoying and we were running into the limitations of how many commands you can put around a circle. So this one actually gets in your way less and uh, gives us more room to grow. We realized once we changed the menu, we had to update the walkthrough too. So now we've added a bunch of new sections to the walkthrough to guide new mappers into like best practices in mapping. So for example, like we train them, okay, here's how you square your buildings and here's how you use the new menu to do it, right? Um, we've also mapped the town in a lot more detail just to give mappers like a better idea of what's possible from OpenStreetMap. We didn't have any of this stuff in the tutorial before. And we did a lot of work on lo localization, so the entire town, like all the businesses, like the street names, and the, even down to the address level details can be translated to all the different languages that we support. And we give users a lot more freedom to step through the, the walk through at their own pace, and you know, they have different sections where they can play around. Then, two new worldwide image resources. This is, this is pretty exciting. Digital Globe released premium and standard for us to trace from, and Esri followed a few months later by allowing us to use their world imagery layer for, trans, for, um, I'm sorry, for tracing. Um, so this is an exciting time for OpenStreetMap, right? More companies are opening up their imagery and we can trace from it. So thank you, Digital Globe and Esri. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. If you see anyone from Digital Globe or Esri, say, say thank you. Um, <laughs> then I merged this cool keyboard shortcut screen over the summer. Kushan and Ajit worked on this. And you can press the question mark button anywhere in ID and it'll pop up, you know, what commands are available. And uh, that leads me into this. So info panels, right? ID has always been kind of geared towards beginner users, so we don't want to complicate the user interface with a whole lot of like buttons and things like that, um, and advanced features. But now we have this user interface um, pattern where we can kind of stack these things up along the bottom, so you can get more information about like the background imagery, like when the imagery was taken. History will show you, um, you know, I guess who last edited an item, and location gives you latitude and longitude coordinates. Measurement will let you measure like distances and areas and things. Uh, we're probably gonna be adding more of these, but this is more for like advanced things that were previously out of scope for ID. We did some improvements to Mapillary. Kushan worked on this. So we fetch from their API like information about like what detections happen in each image and we kind of overlay them down in the, the corner in the little viewer. We also show the date and time that the image was taken. So that's super useful. And then finally, we added some things to the save screen. We've added, we pull hashtags out of the comments so that you know, they can go in their own field and people can write better comments and do better analysis of hash, the hashtags in the, the comments. And we've added this one box that says, I would like somebody to review my edits. This is more for like new users who maybe like want somebody to take an extra look at what they're doing and they want some feedback. So we're gonna be integrating that with more tools. Um, hopefully we see some people like giving feedback to new users that way. Thank you, that's like all the time I have. <laughs> it's a lot to get through, but please check us out on GitHub, star us, follow us, and follow me on Twitter for more ID news, and looking forward to meeting you all at the conference. Thanks. Alrighty. Howdy, y'all. My name's Davey Lovin, and I'm a student here at CU Boulder. Um, my project is entitled the Lesotho Footbridge Project. And as you see here, not only am I a student at CU Boulder, but I'm also a volunteer for Bridges to Prosperity. And uh, Bridges to Prosperity is an organization, it's a group of volunteers who help design and build pedestrian footbridges with communities in need. So these are communities that are often cut off from access when the rivers flood in the rainy season. 
Story goes is uh, we build a ton of these footbridges. They're suspended footbridges. It's a standard design that we work with, and we help these developing communities. We send us a team of students every summer, about six to eight of them. We work alongside 20 community members, and we build these footbridges with the communities. These are examples of the bridges that our club has built in the last couple years. We built seven in Bolivia and one in Swaziland, as you'll see later. Like I said, it's a standard footbridge design that we use. We can build up different tiers on either side of the river depending on the height of the river and like the characteristics and the topography. Um, and the story goes as well is that our chapter, the University of Colorado chapter, uh, has started a new program in Swaziland in Southern Africa. Um, we sent a team of people uh, about a year and a half ago to do a survey trip and we did a bunch of topographic surveys as you can see here and then also we've got uh, just, we met with the local ministers and communities to see what they had need for and this is an example of us visiting a broken bridge. Um, so we went to the country and we also met a bunch of officials um, and we started the process of helping them or working with them in order to implement these footbridges because we are not providing everything. We must have partnerships. That's our model. So uh, those partnerships, a ton of uh, memorandums of understanding and a lot of Skype calls. And this summer we broke ground in our first inaugural bridge in Swaziland at Etlangeni. And it's a 73 meter bridge um, and we built the heck out of it. Here's a little video if you can see just uh, how we work with communities. Um, story goes is this is us uh, putting the rocks that are mined from the hillside nearby uh, into the foundation. And uh, so we use local materials like the rocks that are found and the sand from the site in order to you know, build these bridges. Um, and what do you know? After it all, we had a bridge. So that's pretty freaking sweet. Um, next off is, um, so basically we were working in Swaziland, as I said, and then I thought to myself, huh, you know, there's this other country here, Lesotho. Like, what's up with Lesotho? So as y'all are probably on it too, um, there's this humanitarian open street map team, and I saw like this post about Map Lesotho, Map Lesotho, and I was like, what's Map Lesotho? Oh, apparently it's a super neat project where people are making Lesotho the best mapped country in Africa, and the story is, it is. Um, they do, you know, the ID editor, and they have all these, they train. This is a room full of ladies that are just doing mapping and do mapathons in the country, and it's wicked neat. Um, I sent an email to this guy. I was like, yo, bruh, like, yo, hook me up. Like, let's see what it do with Lesotho. Maybe y'all need bridges. And homeboy was like, oh, bruh, we need some bridges for show. And so what do you know? Whoop, whoop. Um, the next thing you know, we're in Lesotho after our bridge build in Swaziland, and we're surveying a bunch of different sites there. You can see we're, we're there with uh, my girl Tzidi and my girl Moja Bang that took us to the sites to visit, right? So that's pretty freaking sweet. Then I got home and I was like, all right, word, I'm going to do some spatial data analysis because that's what I like to do in my free time. So I looked at the Lesotho data, and like as you can see, it's so dank, so dense, like in Lesotho, that's the border with South Africa, and outside of it, there's not a whole lot. So I was like, word, this is some fertile soil for some dank, it's a spatial data analysis. So I was like, whoop, whoop. I downloaded the DEMs. I got the Landsat imagery as my base maps. I was like, word, I'm going to take the centroids of all the polygons for the residential areas in the country. And then I'm going to run an analysis where I, so this is an example of the analysis where I take all of those uh, residential areas and I route them to the nearest, in this example, it's towns, and then hospitals and schools. And as you can see, that these are all the traces to the nearest um, town. And then this is um, kind of like the darker the dot, the farther away they are from the towns, as you can see. So then I do this accessibility calculation where I'm like, okay, word, so we got the distance to hospital, school, and town, and then if you're far away from all those things, you're probably not accessible. So having that as a metric of accessibility, there was a talk earlier today on that sort of stuff, which is freaking sweet too. Any case, so now I got this metric of accessibility for the country, which is super tight, and then I just changed the color ramp here for, you know, y'all to see the visual, and then I do a thin plate spline model, say what, and I got a interpolated surface over the whole country, and just so you can see the surface in its bare form. And then I overlay the rivers and I'm like, word. So then, um, sorry, I gotta go fast. I got a story to tell y'all. So basically, as you can see here, the river down on the, uh, the left there, you can see that the accessibility is pretty cut off by the river. I also did a little extra analysis where I wrote this little Python code to, you know, to, you know, perpendicular lines for the rivers, and then it like sampled it on both sides, and then found out the places that was the highest gradient. As you can see, there are some of those lines there. Word, next step, all right. Word, so we're doing the same thing we did in Swaziland. We had this footbridge proposal that I wrote while in a library in Alaska this summer because I really cared that much about it. And so here we have like the introduction and then here just like a table of services because like I say, we work with all these in-country partners in order to put these bridges on. So this is what we got to do. Um, and yeah, that is it. 
Story goes is uh, we want to involve Lesotho, Map Lesotho, and some more site uh, identification. We want to expand to uh, Uganda and Rwanda, um, so and, uh, some other countries nearby, and do some more analysis. And I also want to ping y'all if y'all got some ideas, because I know I just talked a ton about like what I had going on, but for real, like if y'all want to weigh in, I'm super about it. Um, and I really thank y'all for your time. Just uh, some acknowledgments, all the Map Lesotho team, my boy Tupac, and the people of the Kingdom of Lesotho. Y'all can check out the GitHub if you want. I don't have any documentation, but you can uh, fool with the source code all you want. Um, that's a really cute picture of this baby on the lady's back as we were doing a survey. And uh, yeah, thank y'all. This is a super cool conference. I love y'all. Peace. Oh, it started. Yeah. <laughs> I think we just need to reopen it. Yeah. You tell me when. I'm ready. Yep. Okay. Hi, I'm Martha Morrissey, and I'm a graduate student here at CU Boulder in the Department of Geography. And today I'll be discussing my research about crowdsourced data and cycling. So it's really important to understand cycling because um, it has significance for health, environment, and policy. Um, a recent survey of US cities came out, and it, there was a correlation found between the happiest cities and the cities with the most bike lanes. Um, so cycling is important. Um, so traditionally, cycling was understood through manual cycling counts, where people were sitting at key intersections throughout cities and counting during peak morning and peak afternoon commute hours. But this is not happening every day of the year. This is happening on a quarterly basis or sometimes a monthly basis. But now there's emerging data sources from apps such as Strava that allow for a lot more data. People can record any bike ride or run they do with a smartphone or a GPS-enabled device. Um, so some more about Strava. In 2015 alone, there were over 170 million cycling and running trips recorded. This is a heat map for the city of Chicago showing the trips that were used. So Chicago, um, so Strava is a way to really augment these cycling data sources that were traditionally used with manual counts. So specifically, I'm researching how can cycling flows in specific city corridors be understood and modeled through the fusion of crowdsourced data and traditional data count sources. Another data source I'm really excited to be working with is OpenStreetMap data. And specifically from OpenStreetMap data, I'm working with the, um, the road speed limits um, and the cycling infrastructure. And what I really like about OpenStreetMaps is it tells the user um, if the infrastructure is on the road or if it's separated in a path. Other key factors we're working with in the modeling framework include population density, topographical data such as slope, um, the presence of bike share and how much they're used, um, bike infrastructure, and again, the count datas. Um, so first, I'm working with the city of Chicago. Um, Chicago biking is already pretty well established here. There's over 200 miles of bike paths, and by 2020, they're set to expand that to 645 miles. So this is a really interesting city to look at. So I first started by replicating a study from 2016, working with a Poisson generalized linear model to understand the relationship between crowdsourced count data and manual count data. Um, so this model, our, our results were consistent with the other study's results, which was good. Um, we found a correlation of about 0.8 between the, the crowdsourced cycling counts and the manual cycling count data. Also month cycleway type um, were significant predictors. But this model isn't the best way to approach this problem. It's a good start, um, but it's an oversimplification because it treats the streets that people are cycling on as separate, but they're interconnected. And that makes sense when you look at this map. Um, we see the colored pink lines. The darker the pink means the more cyclists that have been on that road. And there's a specific pattern here. And the GLM currently isn't capturing that pattern. So it's really important to think spatially. Also, when you're thinking about biking, um, it's important to think about clustering. So we see the clustering of counts, um, and this is just one neighborhood in Chicago, but we found statistically significant clustering in certain areas. Um, 
and we'll find that when we expand this to the whole city. In addition to thinking spatially, you also need to think temporally. Um, so cycling ebbs and flows throughout the day. Um, we really care about the peak morning and peak afternoon hours, and also how to adjust seasonally. Most people do not cycle in the winter like that brave man. Um, so the Strava data allows us to combine space and time um, at a really fine resolution, so the model should address this. We can think about space and time together using um, a weights matrix that accounts for both of those, um, adding the third dimension of time. So how to use that? Our next steps, we're going to be working with more advanced models, such as conditional autoregressive models, where that weight matrix can go in as a term. We also want to work with recurrent neural networks, because they've been successful um, within the field of traffic predictions. Um, so once we get more models working, we want to expand it to smaller cities, such as Farmingdale, New York, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, St. Petersburg, Florida, and Bentonville, Arkansas, to really increase cycling in a variety of places. Um, I'd like to close out really emphasizing how powerful crowdsourced data is um, and how it, can, it has a place shaping future transportation policy decisions, such as bike infrastructure. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Strava Metro for data access, People for Bikes for also helping me get data access, um, the CU Earth Lab, and my advisor, Dr. Carson Farmer. Next, actually, unless Tyler's here, I don't think he's. I don't think he could make it. So. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Let me just open this up for you. Okay, perfect. All right. Hi, my name is Danielle Golan, and I'm the science communication specialist for NASA's LP DAC where the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, long acronym, um, we're located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the USGS Earth Resources Observation and Science Center. So maybe some of you have been there, saw a couple of nods. And we specifically distribute data about the Earth's land surface. Now, if you're in this room, you're probably interested in geography or maybe civil engineering or understanding more about the place, whatever that means to you, where you're from or maybe where you're currently at, there's something that draws you to mapping. So in the world of the LPDAC, we provide data to make maps that tell stories about the sky from the sky above. These stories tell us about how the physical land has changed, is changing, or we can help us predict how it might change in the future. And most importantly, the entire archive is available to mappers at no cost. So you can use this data to learn more about telling stories about important things happening on the Earth's land surface that are important to you. And these data are provided by a plethora of sources. So we have... So we have the SNPP NASA VIRS and Terra and Aqua Moda satellite sensors. They provide us daily coverage of the Earth and provide us clues about larger areas. So we can study things like the health of vegetation or impacts of urban heat islands during heat waves in the summer. We have our Terra Aster satellite sensor. It's useful in terms of natural disasters to observe the Earth a little closer and also to observe global elevation, so understanding how tall some of the tallest mountains are. And if you're interested in Aster data, I'll be talking more about it tomorrow. And then we have our community products, which are derived from one or more NASA Earth observing missions. And they currently provide us with information about emissivity. And then we have perhaps my favorite, our NASA measures products. These extend the life of previous missions, but they're looking at that data in a unique, different way than what it was originally created for. And using this, we can learn about like different types of crops on the Earth or observed forests since the 1980s. So using our data, we can observe on a grand or huge scale the entire world or down to a 15 meter resolution, which is a little bit more of a lower resolution than most of you are used to, but I'll explain in a second. So I'll look at two examples in a local scale. So here's the city of Joplin, Missouri. On May 22, 2011, an EF5 tornado hit Joplin with wind speeds that were 320 kilometers or 200 miles per hour. The tornado remained on the ground for 38 minutes, which is 20 minutes longer than a normal tornado, and it covered 35.6 kilometers, or 22.1 miles. And I have a personal tie to Joplin, as one of my close family friends lives there, so I spent a lot of my childhood during the summer growing up on, and visiting their family farm. It's where my sister learned how to drive. Um, and last year, with the fifth anniversary of the storm, as a geographer, I knew this was definitely one of those locations that I got a map. 
and I wanted to learn more about what happened and how the city's doing. So using Astro data, we can observe what the city looked like before the tornado hit. And I've pointed out two regions to particularly pay attention to, the regional medical center and the local tech and high school. The Astro sensor was tasked to capture the data after the, to capture the area after the tornado, and it captured this image on May 30th. So the Astro satellite sensor has to be told to turn on to capture data, but this can be beneficial in times of natural disaster as it sometimes captures the area before a different satellite does for freely data. And here you can see the destruction from the tornado that damaged 30% of the city, including destroying the medical center, the high school, and the tech center, as I pointed out. The tornado caused about $2.8 billion worth of damage and claimed the lives of 158 people. And with this no-cost imagery, we can understand with a view from above just how large the tornado was, where it went, and more importantly, what areas were hit the hardest and need our help. And it's definitely useful during times of mapathons to help with these areas. So the Astro satellite sensor captured a cloud-free view of the area a few months later, where the scar is still visible. And five years later, Astro captured this image. The scar is still visible, but we can observe how the city changed. And then pulling further away, the Terra Modis, we can see NDVI values for the city of Joplin at 250 meter resolution. So NDVI provides us with a story about how healthy or green the vegetation in the area is. And so in the case of Joplin, we can physically see the tornado scar and how the tornado impacted the health of that vegetation. And then this is the same time period of the summer, but from this most recent summer, we can see how some of the healthy vegetation was regained, what was previously lost in the tornado, though there are still some bare spots. Some people got a map because it's a fun hobby. I love finding interesting locations on the earth. Some people got a map to learn about the history of their town or to develop their current town. And some people got a map to help rebuild an area after a natural disaster, but in the end we all got a map. And if you got a map and you want to use any of the LPDAC data we distribute and have questions, you can reach out to our user services team or find me at the conference, or if you use our data currently, talk to me. I love learning about how people use our data. Thank you for your time. Hey everybody, I'm Jeff Ferrar with Digital Globe, here to talk to you about OSM editing using UAV imagery. Uh, I want to preface this by saying a lot of you guys out there know Digital Globe is a satellite imagery company. Um, I'm a drone nerd, I absolutely freaking love drones. Um, so this presentation isn't going to be so much about satellite imagery, but more about my passion about drones and trying to get the imagery that I capture into OpenStreetMap. Um, a little bit of background here, I'm not a programmer, this is not a technical talk by any means. Um, I kind of hacked my way through this solution just using some tools uh, that I use on a daily basis and got to a solution that worked. So let's kick it off. Uh, at a high level problem, um, I moved into a brand new development neighborhood about 2015, around the same time I discovered OpenStreetMap um, through a mapathon with Kevin Bullock at Digital Globe. Um, he kind of challenged me to get my drone data into OSM uh, so that I could have a uh, better use of getting uh, an Uber to my house, uh, getting a pizza delivered, and if needed, any emergency services um, that was a result of out-of-date maps. Um, so he challenged me to get the drone up in the air and update OpenStreetMap. This is how the map that I discovered of my neighborhood looked in 2015 uh, using 2012 imagery. So the star is where my house was. There's a huge gap of uh, field there where there's no development, but I was clearly living in that spot, so there was a huge challenge. Um, so I, I needed to take action right away to get some of those services that I, I took for granted before. Uh, here's a little bit of background of my drone. Uh, this is things out of date by now. I'm in negotiations with my wife to get a new one for this Christmas. <laughs> um, crossing my fingers on that. Um, but this thing can be had for just a couple hundred bucks now, um, and the capabilities actually in using some of this, uh, this software uh, can get you guys pretty useful data. Um, so to overcome kind of the limited transmission range of this out-of-date drone, um, it had a pretty cool follow me feature. Um, I took a little bike ride around my neighborhood with having the drone follow me overhead, probably freaked out a bunch of my neighbors. Um, but I took this data, uh, ran it through PIX4D to generate an ortho mosaic and a DSM um, and uh, 3D mesh product, which is really cool. PIX4D is amazing, I recommend you guys try it. Um, but from there I took the mosaic, uh, or first of all, I ran it through PIX4D, processed the video into stills, 
um, and generated this ortho mosaic and these other products as well. From there I took, uh, since the video didn't have any uh, geo information, I took some, I kind of cheated, took some digital globe imagery, geocoded the drone data uh, with the ortho mosaic that I generated uh, and turned it into a geo reference product that I could then uh, import into a tile set on Mapbox, uh, load it into a style, and then use the uh, leaflet API link to bring it into OpenStreetMap. Uh, and then I was finally using my drone imagery to create vectors and add features in my neighborhood, finally got it on the map. Uh, so here's kind of the level of detail I was able to distinguish in what I'm mapping currently in my neighborhood. Um, features like manhole covers, light posts, solar panels, handicapped spaces, fire hydrants, really down to fine detail that would be otherwise super challenging to do in satellite imagery. And finally, I'm on the map and I'm getting pizza delivered to my house and my Uber's having no problem picking me up, so all the problems are solved. Uh, thanks to all of these uh, providers uh, to help me get there. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Beata and I'm from Telenav Europe, Romania. Today I will present shortly the OpenStreetCam plugin. Does anyone know what the OpenStreetCam product is all about? Okay, so the OpenStreetCam plugin helps uh, the community to improve OpenStreetMap by displaying up-to-date street view images. The images are collected to download the OpenStreetCam platform. The OpenStreetCam platform is a free and open platform that improves OSM by uh, uh, street view images captured by you. Uh, the OpenStreetCam plugin uh, can be downloaded throughout the familiar way from just some uh, plugin preferences. After you download the plugin, you need to restart JOSM. Uh, there are some user configurable preference settings. You can change uh, the map view settings, image settings, track settings, and also cache settings. At a, a small zoom level, starting with zoom level 16, we display OSM segments uh, where we have OpenStreetCam data coverage. The segments that are opaque means that they, there are more uh, OpenStreetCam data, while the segments that are lighter uh, means that we have less OpenStreetCam data there. The OpenStreetCam plugin has a layer attached to it and also an OpenStreetCam window. Both of these elements can be enabled and disabled. Uh, as you zoom in more, you will see individual uh, image locations. Image locations are uh, illustrated by an arrow icon, and the arrow icon is rotated based on the image heading. Uh, the image locations can be filtered. For now, you can filter based on date, and also you can see only your contributed images. Um, okay, so each image location can be selected. After you select an image, you will see the track to which this image belongs, and also the image is loaded in the OpenStreetCam panel. So there are a few options available for playing with the track. You can see previous image, next image, nearby image. You can uh, play the track. Uh, you can even download the merged OSM way. Uh, for cases when the location of the image is not centered, uh, you can click on the center icon and the map will be centered, and you can see also the OpenStreetCam web page. For each of these uh, actions, we have also keystrokes, and this way we will uh, uh, make more usable for hardcore JOSM users. And now this uh, little demo shows uh, the navigation between the images of a track, uh, previous image, next image, and also play track. The play track uh, functionality is useful when you would like to go through a track uh, really fast. Another important uh, feature is uh, the nearby uh, image. 
uh, this uh, feature is useful when uh, on the selected image some of the map features are not uh, so visible and this way you can uh, load a nearby photo that belongs to another track. Okay, so um, with OpenStreetCamp pl plugin, you will be able to load also high quality images. By default, we load uh, larger thumbnails, but uh, in order to observe some uh, details in the map, in some cases, it is necessary to have access all to the, also the, to the high quality image. Uh, each image uh, can be zoomed in and zoomed out using the mouse well, and in an already zoomed in image, you can uh, observe uh, details by moving the image left, right, up, and down. Um, okay, so another important feature was to uh, facilitate easy uh, image loading without letting the user to load only a small thumbnail by mouse hover event. Uh, in this case, when you uh, use this feature, the higher quality image will be loaded when you maximize the OpenStreetCam um, panel. So this is all regarding the existing features. What about new features? We are currently working in uh, adding traffic signs features. This will mean that we will display automatically detected traffic signs both for location uh, view and uh, also for individual tracks. And we will add uh, some filters based on traffic sign categories. And we also would like to improve the workflow when users uh, came to edit OpenStreetCam from the web. Website. Uh, we can do this by enhancing JOSM remote control, and we would like to somehow, with one click, to load also the image, the track, and also the corresponding OSM data. Okay, and this is all for. Okay, we're down to our last one already. Clifford. Exercise today, aren't you? <laughs> I wish. What? I guess I'll allow this. I, I, I'm here talking about. Well, he's doing this. I'm here talking about search engine optimization. It's a really boring subject, but pay attention because this is going to be fun. Um, <laughs> I got interested in search engine optimization because I look at every new mapper. Um, in the state of Washington. And I see a lot of these companies trying to put stuff into OpenStreetMap. One of the things I've noticed is they're putting a lot of garbage in there. Uh oh. Garbage like that. <laughs> you want to start over? Okay, so they're, they're, they're putting stuff in with no tags, or at least not useful tags. Um, the, one of the worst things I saw, just, in fact, just the other day, they actually put the node right on the street to say this is where that business is. That's probably not true. And so it's, so it's really frustrating. And I'm, I'm tired of working because they never answer any change set comments you put on there. You send them a, a personal message in OpenStreetMap, they don't answer, they don't talk to you. Um, I'm hitting the wrong button. So why are they doing this? They believe that they can improve their customers' page ranking, which means they're going to make more money. So people pay a lot of money to have their page ranking um, improved. And they do this by having backlinks. And they think by putting their website in OpenStreetMap, that's going to improve their page rank. That means they're going to make more money. Um, so backlinks. Backlinks are nothing more than the URLs you see. The interesting thing about what the Googles of the world do is they look at the page authority of who's ever got that link in there, and the higher the page authority, the more you're going to raise up on page ranking. OpenStreetMap is really high. It's one of the highest that there is out there. Uh, I also put Mapbox and Digital Globe on here because I know there'd be a few people from here. Um, Interestingly enough, since about 2009, we've been adding a nofollow reference tag to every URL. And that tells the search engines, just ignore this. It's useless data. Don't count it. Uh, but they're still putting this stuff in there. Um, so what should we do? 
they're not talking to us uh, very well. So I've met with a, one company that seems to want to talk. They're not doing anything yet. And I'm, I'm looking to do a trial. And I'm looking for mappers out here. That's why I'm here. To help us do a community import of using like map roulette of this data. Because it's a good data. This is good POIs that we'd love to have an open street map. But if we do it on our control by us putting it in there, I think we're going to get much better results. So interestingly enough, while I was doing this, I discovered something that I just did not know. Um, websites are now including uh, what they call microdata on them. And this is not data that you and I see. This is embedded in the website. So like this local Jiffy Lube near my house, they have this data embedded in there. Tells their hours of operation, their address, their phone numbers, um, their business name, what type of business it is. This is all embedded in there in a structured format. Um, it's it's an organization called schema.org. It's on GitHub. It's a community process. They think there's like 10 to 12 million website URLs that have this data in there. Um, it's it's um, Open data, it's, excuse me, it's, it's a Creative Commons type of uh, information, so we can all use it. Um, this is the example that, of that same uh, website I was talking about. This is the Jiffy Lube near my house. This is all the information that you can get out of um, Google. They have a structured data tool. And you just put a URL in there, and you can see if there's anything in there. So I found this in, right near my home. Uh, I've been staying, uh, on my trip over here, I've been staying at um, Hilton Hotels. None of the Hilton properties have any of this data in there. So it's, it's there, and, but it's still spreading. It's relatively new. Uh, but what's interesting about this thing, if we can put this into our editors, so the editor goes out and queries these websites, brings back the information, we could eliminate typos, we could give consistent business names, um, we could get more data in there because if there's anything I hate, it's typing a lot of data about a, about a business. You know, it gets boring. Um, so this would make it really simple to collect a lot of good information relatively easily. So that's my proposal. Um, we're going to work with some SEOs, and I hope to see a lot of this stuff in there. And hopefully the Brian's of the world and the, the Josms of the world will uh, support this. Thank you very much. Cool. I enjoyed all those talks very, very much. Thank you for all the speakers. Um, this was an exciting session. Uh, we have some time for questions, so I think most, if not all, of the speakers are still around. So um, how shall we do this? Let's, let's just um, open the floor for questions. Who has a question? You're right there. <laughs> 